Hello again. The trifling disturbances in Liverpool recently caused me no little amusement. A hundred years ago, the citizens of Liverpool really knew how to riot. Something like 5,000 West Africans had come to work in the Liverpool docks during the First World War, and after the armistice in 1918, many discharged soldiers felt that they were unable to get work because of the large number of black people employed. It was this underlying anger which provoked a bout of rioting in the early summer of 1919. What were described by the newspapers as colour riots were not limited to Liverpool and were in some parts of the country far worse. In Cardiff, for example, four men were killed when shooting broke out between blacks and whites. The Manchester Guardian reported that Last night, an altercation between blacks and whites led to the complete holding up of the docks district, revolvers being freely used and casualties caused by bullets, razors, sticks and stones. As usual, discharged soldiers were heavily involved in the fighting. When the British police went on strike, therefore, in August 1919, there had already been a bit of trouble in Liverpool. Before the police strike even began, there was a mood of anger and defiance in the city, to say nothing of a great deal of poverty and unemployment. As darkness fell on the evening of Friday, August 1st, 1919, about half the police officers in Liverpool had failed to show up for duty, and the mayhem began. The rioting and looting which broke out as soon as the word spread that the ranks of the police were so depleted was not in any sense politically motivated. There had already been rioting in Liverpool a few months previously, and this was for many simply a chance to show the authorities what they thought of them, while acquiring free goods at the same time. It was a spontaneous outpouring of anger with a strong business edge to it. The dual temptations to show contempt for the forces of law and order while at the same time getting new shoes, bottles of whisky or gold jewellery, proved irresistible to some people in Liverpool. The trouble began in Scotland Road, Byron Street and Great Homer Street. The mob's targets were, to begin with, clothes shops, jewellers and pawnbrokers. At first, the authorities in Liverpool hoped that enrolling special constables would be enough to dampen down the disturbances. Shopkeepers and businessmen were sworn in and issued with armbands before being sent to the aid of the regular officers who were doing their best to disperse the crowds of looters. By the early hours of Saturday morning, though, it was plain that more would be needed than a few hastily recruited amateurs. At dawn, the wreckage of shop fronts along Main Road showed the extent of the damage caused by the rioting. There was every prospect that with nightfall on Saturday the looting and rioting would resume, and so there was little choice but to issue an appeal for help from the armed forces. The government, fearing a complete breakdown of law and order which might prove contagious, had already ordered three warships to sail from their anchorage in Scarpa Bay in the Orkney Islands. Chief of these was the mighty super dreadnought HMS Valiant, with a displacement of 29,000 tonnes, Valiant was as long as London's BT Tower. She was more than a match for any other ship in the world. Now, accompanied by two destroyers, HMS Valiant was steaming at top speed towards Liverpool. There were two reasons for sending a naval task force to Liverpool. One was so that sailors could be landed to secure the docks and protect them from rioters or saboteurs. This was a realistic fear because the dock gates were actually set on fire during the second night of disturbances. This end could probably have been achieved though by using some of the thousands of soldiers who were brought onto the streets of the city over that bank holiday weekend. The primary purpose of mooring such an impressive ship in the Mersey, clearly visible from across Liverpool, was as a show of force. Seeing the dreadnought and her escort of destroyers would send a signal to both the rioters and striking police officers that the gloves were now off and the government was ready to use any means at its disposal to pacify the city. To underline the message being delivered by the presence of warships moored near the city, thousands of troops were rushed into Liverpool on the day following the rioting. 
They were supported by four tanks, which were positioned on the high ground between the Northwestern Hotel and St. George's Hall. Troops in full battle kit, including steel helmets and with fixed bayonet, patrolled the streets and stood guard at public buildings. This show of force was enough during the daytime to discourage any trouble, but when night fell, the rioting resumed. The first shop to have its windows smashed on Saturday night was a jeweller's near the Rotunda Theatre. Troops were rushed to the area and a magistrate read the riot act to the crowd. Fearing that they were about to be overwhelmed by the huge mobs, who showed no fear of them, the troops opened fire, shooting over the heads of the rioters. This quietened things down in that part of the city, but the looting simply spread elsewhere to places where there were fewer soldiers. The troops were thinly scattered and this meant that every soldier might be outnumbered hundreds to one when a shop was being looted. One soldier stood helpless as crowds smashed their way into a clothing store and men climbed into the window and handed out fur coats to the women who were present. A little distance away, some men brought a wholesome cart to a looted shop and removed the remaining stock wholesale. On Sunday, the 3rd of August, General Snow of the Western Command arrived in Liverpool to take control of the troops. Having found, though, that the soldiers were seemingly reluctant to act against them, the crowd of looters on Sunday became bolder and attacked a brewery in broad daylight. This led to the first fatality of the rioting. In Love Lane, a bottling store was broken open and men began getting drunk on the beer that was found on the premises. They were so busily engaged in this pleasant occupation that they failed to notice a lorry load of soldiers pull up. These men had been ordered to put a stop to the looting and so arrested several men, putting them in the back of the lorry and they prepared to drive off. So hostile, though, was the reaction of the crowd that shots were fired over their heads. This had no effect, but the rumour spread that only blanks were being used. A man called Thomas Howlett darted forward and grabbed a soldier's rifle. After a brief struggle for possession of the weapon, it went off, wounding Howlett in the thigh. He died in hospital the following day. An inquest later decided that the soldier holding the rifle, Lance Corporal Seymour, was not to blame for the death. A verdict of justifiable homicide was recorded. Elsewhere in the city on Sunday, stones were thrown at the troops who were becoming tougher in their response to the continuing disorder. In Stanley Road, about a mile from the centre of the city, the looters began working systematically, darting forward and smashing windows and then grabbing what they could before the soldiers could get to the scene. The police also tried to intervene but were not able to gain control of the situation. Troops fired on the crowd and one man was taken to hospital with a bullet wound to his neck. About ten at night, crowds gathered near St George's Hall where one of the tanks was stationed. They began to loot shops along London Road until a squad of soldiers first fired over the heads of the looters and then made a bayonet charge at them. So far, much of the rioting had been opportunistic looting and stone throwing, but an hour after the bayonet charge in London Road, two soldiers standing sentry duty on the corner of Christian Street were attacked by a mob who were obviously intent upon injuring them. They responded by firing warning shots to drive away the men threatening them. So menacing were things growing as the Sunday night drew on that the army set up a Lewis gun in London Road. The machine gun was aimed along the length of the street so that if need be the area could be swept with automatic fire. In Birkenhead too the troops were having a hard time of it and it was only with great difficulty that they managed to secure the docks. The fear was that rioters might tamper with the pump houses or otherwise sabotage machinery. On the morning of Monday the 4th of August the Valiant together with the destroyers HMS Whitby and HMS Venomous were moored off Prince's landing stage and sailors from all three vessels landed and took over the docks from the soldiers who had been guarding them. Nearly 400 people, men, women and children, appeared in court on charges relating to looting and rioting. One man asked for bail on the grounds that he had been wounded in a bayonet charge. 
the magistrate was unsympathetic and told him that he had received adequate medical treatment in the prison hospital. To the relief of the army and police, rain began falling on the Monday evening. The old saying about rain being the policeman's best friend was neatly illustrated because the heavy downpours discouraged people from hanging around the streets that night. The army had changed their tactics too, which helped. Rather than being burdened with full kit, including rifles that they were reluctant to use, the soldiers had all been issued with pickaxe handles, and these weapons were all they carried on their patrols on Monday. The consequence was that the centre of Liverpool remained quiet that night, and this particular bout of rioting died away. This, then, is what real rioting looks like, and I'm bound to say it makes the events in Liverpool this weekend look like a Vickers Tea Party.